we'll pick up uh, almost where uh, Brother Chuck left off last week. John chapter 6, and we'll begin with, we'll just read 42 and 43. He covered this last week, but it'll make tonight's content make sense. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, murmur not amongst yourselves. And so you can see here that they're, they're hearing Jesus say, I came down from heaven. They said, wait a minute, what, what are you talking about? We know your mom and dad. We, we know your mother and father. And the reality is they knew his mother, but they had no idea to who his father was. They thought that it was Joseph, but they should have known better because when Jesus was introduced to Israel by his cousin, John the Baptist, it was very unique the way that he was introduced he was introduced as the Lamb of God. And now many of these Jews, they were, they were professional word birds. They, they knew the scriptures. But yet, if they had have done just a little bit of research, they would have realized, not just on John the Baptist's testimony, they would have realized from the scripture, this is the promised Messiah. And so when, when you look back at the Old Testament, Jesus fulfilled any number of prophecies, probably more than, uh, than, than we could think. But I want to just go through a couple of them uh, to show how easily it would have been for them to validate that Jesus was the Messiah on whom they waited. Micah chapter 5, verse 2 says, But thou Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little amongst the thousands of Judah, yet out of these shall go forth unto me that is to be a ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old and from everlasting. So it says here that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, which, in fact, he was born in Bethlehem. Then if we look at Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah, a fulfillment of the prophecy. Then we see the time of his birth. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto, the Messiah, unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. And of course, that's 70 weeks of weeks. Uh, and three score two weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome time. So they could have calculated from Daniel's prophecies to the exact time that the Messiah would come. It's all in the scripture. And then finally his birth. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So they knew who his mother was. But even though the scripture said he would be born of a virgin, they thought Joseph was his father. They had no idea. So they're saying, uh, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph? No, it's not the son of Joseph. It's the son of God, whose father and mother we know. How is it then, he saith, I come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, murmur not amongst yourselves. This lets us know that they were murmuring, contending amongst themselves. How in the world could he possibly have come from heaven when, when we know his lineage? We know his brothers and his sisters. Verse 44 says, no man, Jesus is speaking, no man can come to me except the father which hath sent me draw him and I will raise him up the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall, be, they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Now, I mentioned a, a couple of sessions ago when I was teaching is that when you slow down and you read through the Scripture slowly, you begin to see and understand why Jesus was hated by the religious establishment of that day. And we're going to see tonight that he doesn't parse words. He doesn't negotiate on truth. He just puts it out there, take it or leave it. And in this case, tonight we'll see that most of them, they, they walked away from him. But he begins by saying, no man can come to me except the father which has sent me draw him. Now, the reality is man is unsaved man is in a state of total depravity. 
That simply means that there's nothing in us that would draw ourselves to God. It takes for the Holy Spirit to begin to deal with our lives, bring conviction upon our lives, order our lives so that we, we make such a bad shipwreck that we cry out for help. But it's important to understand God doesn't make anybody be saved. He'll, he'll draw us, but he won't drag us. <laughs> He'll, he'll draw our lives in, but he won't force us and twist our arm and make us live saved, as some of our Calvinist friends might say. But rather, his Holy Spirit, he begins to draw us. His will is that no, no man should perish. And when he draws us and we line our will up with his will, that's when the born again experience happens. When we, by faith, agree with God God doesn't want any man to perish. Lord, I don't want to perish. I need a savior. That's when the born again experience happens. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit comes into our life and living and begins to sanctify us. So Jesus is simply saying uh, uh, no man can come to him except the father draw him. And if the father draw him, I will raise him up on the last day. Now, here he's talking about the resurrection of life. He's talking about when he calls out to the, to the saints of all time and just says, come forth and all of the saints from righteous Abel forward, all of them, you and I included, if we're passed on by then, we get up to meet the Lord. He, he's promising that here. And notice he says, I will raise him up. I will do it. He's, it's not a maybe or a if or a condition on it. He said, this will happen. Now, you know, it is it's sometimes we can we can believe things, but when we start getting closer to the event, you know how unbelief kind of kind of sets in. I remember when uh, we were building this facility, we were in the small building over there and we were just beginning to build this facility. And the Lord had told me 15 years earlier that I would build another church. And I the whole 15 years, I'm like, yes, I, I believe that. Let's go. I believe that. But then when it started happening. And I started seeing the iron beams go up. You know, that's the time unbelief can set in your heart. And you wonder, well, I wonder when the other shoe is going to fall. I, I wonder what's going to mess this up. How, how's something bad going to happen to prevent this? And I think that that's something that all of us have to deal with. But Jesus says, I will raise him up in the last day. It is written in the prophets. And here's where he begins to uh, talk to his distractors. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned the Father cometh unto me. Now, what he's saying to the Jews, because they're sitting there, they're mad as they can be because he said he came down from heaven. And he's, he's quoting the prophets. He said, it's written in the prophets, every man that hath heard and hath learned the Father will come to me, well, they were sitting there resisting coming to him, which indicates that they had neither heard nor had they learned the Father, because had they done so, they would have come to Jesus. Verse 46 says, now that, now that any man, not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So this first phrase, not that any man hath seen the Father. We have to be careful. With, you know, sometimes it can look like the Scripture is contradicting other Scriptures. And whenever that happens, it means there's something you don't understand. Because the, the Scripture can't be broken. And so whenever that happens... What you need to do is look at the grammatical accuracy of the scripture. Look at the grammar and figure out what is the grammar saying, not what we think at a superficial brushing across the top of it, but get down into the verbs and the nouns and figure out what is the grammar of the statement. And then once you do that, you go a little bit further. Uh, if it still doesn't make sense and say, okay, what did this word mean? We know what it means now. What did it mean when it was said in the original language? Because some things can get skewed in the translation process. So this first phrase, not that any man hath seen the Father. The word seen here um, is a little bit different than what we might actually think. The word seen in the original, um, in the original language, the original Greek, it means to discern clearly 
or to fully comprehend. It doesn't mean to just look at and look away. It means to look at and fully comprehend what you are looking at. And so when the scripture says no man hath seen fully comprehended the father, that's very accurate because God is eternal. It, no, no one can fully comprehend eternity unless you were also eternal. And so Jesus says, not that any man hath seen fully comprehended the Father, except him which is of God. He hath seen the Father, speaking of himself. So you have the eternal Son. He's able to fully comprehend the Father. But you and I, the Father has to be revealed to us in bits and pieces because we're not infinite, we are finite. He hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth upon me hath everlasting life. Now, this is a wonderful statement Jesus is making. It's really got two sides to it. Seems like a simple statement. He that believeth upon me hath everlasting life. But on the one side, he's saying, he that believeth on me, not he that performeth a certain number of works, not he that has moved far enough in his sanctification process, not he that has done this thing, that thing, or the other thing, you simply believe. You simply evidence faith in God's redemption plan, which is summed up in Jesus Christ. That, that's all that it takes. You simply believe. But now on the other side, he's saying, but you got to believe right. You got to believe on me. <laughs> you got to put your faith in me. He's saying there's no other way. You can't, you can't believe on John the Baptist. You, you can't believe on Herod. You can't believe on somebody else. You have to believe on me. Jesus is the only way to the Father. He is the only hand of grace that has been extended to the human race. And everything else is a farce and a phony. He that believeth on me hath eternal life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which come down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. Now you have to watch the whole flow of what Jesus is saying because he said, I came down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. And they began to get angry because he said, you came from heaven. They said, because he said he came from heaven, they begin to get angry at that. And, and previously they had said to him, what sign do you do? You know, Moses gave us manna from heaven. What, what miracle, what sign are you going to do? And so Jesus is standing his ground. Because they get angry, he's not, he's not fearful of that at all. He's not backing up in any way. In fact, he says it even more plainly. I am that bread from heaven. And some commentators believe that when he said that, he pointed to his own body. I am the bread from heaven is what they believe that the, his uh, gestures would have been. He goes on to say, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness. They had boasted. This was the boast of Israel. Our, God gave us angels food. He gave us manna from heaven. And they just said it in verse 31 of the same chapter. Moses gave us manna from heaven. And Jesus is saying, your father said, it's true. They did eat manna in the wilderness, but now they're dead. <laughs> he says, this is the bread. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that if a man may eat thereof and not die, unlike Moses. That, now, w w we wonder, well, what does that mean? Because uh, all of us are believers and, and the generation of Christians before us, they were believers and, and they died. No, their body wore out. But we have to understand what everlasting life is. And you got get it, get this in your head. Everlasting life is not you living 60 or 70 years and then you get cancer and die. And on the other side of death, right after the funeral, you get up and now you got everlasting life. That's not everlasting life. At the moment that you came to Jesus Christ and put your faith in him, he gave you eternal, everlasting, abundant life right then, which means that there'll be a day that these bodies will just wear out and you just take them off like if your blue jeans wore, wore out 
and you just walk out of it, and the scripture says God has a brand new body waiting for you. It's incorruptible. It'll never get sick. It'll never, it doesn't get tired. It doesn't grow old. We'll live for thousands upon thousands and ten thousands of years and still be the same age. Our hair won't get white. It'll keep all the melatonin, keep your natural color. And, and it won't fall out. <laughs> the belly won't bulge. The knees won't creak. It's an incorruptible body that's not as easy to break as the bodies that we have now. All of this is in store, and that's part of eternal life. So when Jesus is offering eternal life, we need to know what that means. We don't live just like ordinary human beings and then die, and now salvation kicks in and eternal life starts. You have to understand that the moment you came to Jesus Christ and he, he performed the circumcision on your heart and you were born again and the Holy Spirit took his abode on the inside, you are no more just an ordinary human being. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That word creature is creation in the original language. You're a creation that never existed before. I have spiritual organs that unsaved men and women don't have. I have a connection straight to God. When I get up in the morning, boom, there it is. I, I'm connected to him. I speak in a language that I never learned. We're, we're not. We're not what we used to be. If any man be in Christ, he's a brand new creation. When God breathed into Adam's nostrils and Adam stood up a living soul, he, be, he was a creation that had never existed before. When you and I are born again, we are a creation that never existed before. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and they're dead. This is the bread which come down from heaven, that if a man there... Uh, if a man eat thereof, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, we have to understand, we're fairly spiritual minded, being saved and having the advantage of 2,000 years removed from these events. We understand that Jesus is speaking in very spiritual terms. But had you been sitting there that day and having heard your parents weren't spiritual, your grandparents weren't spiritual, you hadn't heard a prophet speak in 400 years, and now all of a sudden Jesus comes in these words of spirit and, and their life, they're struggling to keep up with him, although he is speaking in great plainness. It's easy to understand this in our time. But in that day, not so much. Now, this first phrase here where Jesus says, I am the living bread, Kenneth Weiss, which is a Greek scholar that I read after, he translated this uh, to Jesus saying, I alone am the bread of life. And if you go back through the past verses, you'll find this is the third time that Jesus has said this. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And then the third time he's saying, I alone, nobody else. I alone am the bread of life. To emphasize the point that if a man doesn't eat this bread, he's not going to live forever. I am the bread of life which came down from heaven. He's not backing up, although they're angry about him saying, I came down from heaven. He doesn't back up. He just keeps saying it. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And understand there was no bread there that, there was nothing there for people to actually imbibe like you eat food. But Jesus was speaking spiritually. We eat Christ by faith. We do it by faith. You, you don't have to actually like, I don't know, the, I guess the Catholics do. They, they take communion and they have a little piece of meat or something down in the wine. And they say, well, this was the actual body of Christ. You don't have to do that because it's by faith and by faith alone. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, he's talking here about his going to the cross as the sacrificial lamb. He was going to give his body to be broken uh, on the cross. 
And we, by virtue of our faith, we eat of his broken body. By faith, we drink of his poured out blood, uh, just like we do in communion, but, but it's by faith. And that's how we partake of Jesus Christ. I don't have, I'm just going to grab my Bible here. <clears throat> Jesus said, except you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. Well, John told us early, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. This is how we consume Jesus Christ. This, this is how we, you know, when you, when you eat a steak, you're, you're taking that cow and putting it on the inside. And when you eat the Word of God, you're taking the eternal logos, Christ, and you're putting it on the inside. This is what he's talking about. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Now, he's saying here the reason for Jesus' incarnation, the reason that he came to this world, the primary reason was to die. He came just to die. As the eternal logos, he can't die. Jesus is all life. <laughs> he had to put on human flesh, frail human flesh, so that he could die, so that he could take upon himself the penalty for our sins, and at the same time, he could put his total unsullied righteousness upon whosoever believes in him, and that's, that's the, that's the trade-off. That's, that's the purpose of the sacrifice, which I give for the life of the world. The Jews, therefore, strove amongst themselves. They're striving because they don't like him presenting himself as coming down from heaven. They definitely don't like him saying he's the bread of life, but mainly they don't like that he's not afraid of them. He just keeps pushing further and further. So the Jews therefore strove amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, this first sentence, the Jews therefore strove amongst themselves. You know, God is a good God. And when you don't understand something, when you can't understand what he's saying, you can just ask him. You remember Jesus said, uh, I, I go, and, and he said to the disciples, I, I go, and, and you know the way. And Thomas said, well, Lord, we don't know the way. We don't know where you're going, and we don't know the way. He, he just said, we don't know what you're talking about. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When you don't understand something, just ask God. But these Jews, they, they wouldn't humble themselves and just ask him, we, we don't understand what you're saying. Can you say it more, more plainly? Can you help us to understand? But many times we, we have not because we ask not. And if we, if we want knowledge, the scripture says, James 1 and 5, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. We can just ask God for wisdom if we don't understand. He's saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus, he doesn't back up. He just keeps going, verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we've all heard this. Uh, but we do this still to this day, a uh, symbolism of eating his flesh and drinking his blood. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. This is one of the scriptures we use in communion oftentimes. It's indicative of the last supper that Jesus had with his disciples. And when he had given thanks, he break it, the bread he had, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. They, they had that broken body, and then they consumed it. After the same manner also, he took of the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. So even to this day, we still, by, in, in symbolism, in ceremony, we still show the eating of his flesh and the drinking of his blood. 
He says, except you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. Now, let's understand what that means. It doesn't mean God is mad because you didn't participate and he took life out of you. That's not what it means. It means you were born with no life in you. <laughs> it means you came into this world with no life. You never had no life. And except you eat the flesh and drink the blood, you can't get any life in you because all life comes from Jesus Christ. And so he's reaching out to these uh, extended disciples around him. He's reaching out to his distractors, telling them there are no other options for you. If you would just come to me, you could have eternal life. But they would not come. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up in the last day. He, he keeps saying that there is a day coming that I'm going to call and every person that came to me, I'm going to raise them from the dead. Every last one of them. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Now, if you're not used to, to reading this, it, sometimes it just sounds just like just gobbledygook. It just sounds overly wordy. But Jesus is presenting a reality that, that we right now are experiencing. This last phrase, he says, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you dwell in me. And I in you. Well, how, what does that look like? How, how does that look? Well, you and I right now, if you're born again, if you're saved, you are a member of the body of Christ. You are in him. You are in his crucifixion. You are in his burial. You are in his resurrection. You are co-joined with Christ so that everything he experienced, you now also have experienced. You are crucified with him. You were buried with him. Three days later, you got up in the newness of life with him. You're in him. And now he's in you by virtue of the Holy Spirit who abides in the heart of every born again person. So you see, it's not gobbledygook. He's saying it as plain as it can be said, but it's spiritual. But it's spiritual. As the living father has sent me, and I live by the Father. So he that, live, that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Now he sets out an expectation for those who come to him to eat his flesh, to drink his blood, to receive eternal life. There is an expectation. There's not a cost. It's free. But there is an expectation. As the living Father, this could probably have been better translated, the life-giving Father. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by dependence on the Father, I'm paraphrasing, by dependence on the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by dependence upon me. So see, after we come to Jesus Christ, after he's done the circumcision on our heart, his Holy Spirit has taken up his abode in us, now part of sanctification is learning how to not be independent, but to be dependent upon him, not dependent on each other, dependent upon him. We, we've had this thing over the last, I think it's probably been 20, 30 years where everybody feels that you have to have an accountability partner. Have you ever heard that? An accountability partner. I remember we were building this church over here. It was just building it. And one of the brothers I used to look up to when I, I was still a good brother, um, he was out. I was showing him the building. He goes, well, because we've never been part of a denomination. He was a, a Assemblies of God. He said, well, who, who, who are you accountable to? I mean, you know, who, who do you, who's over you? I said, well, I'm accountable to Jesus. Oh, no, brother, you got you to have, have a structure of men over you to make sure that, well, listen, if I'm not going to do it for Jesus, what, why would I do it for this guy? <laughs> And we have to get out of that mindset. There's nothing between you and Jesus. Me, I, I'm your pastor. I'm not between you and Jesus. I'm over here on the side just doing my job to, to edify the body. But the great shepherd, you, there's nothing between you and him. You have direct access, praise God, to the throne of grace. So we want to learn then to be dependent upon him. We want to learn then to be able to, 
you can call me anytime. I always pray for you. I'll, I'll always help in any way I can. But who do I call when I'm going through? <laughs> I've had to learn how to call on Jesus Christ. And I've had to learn how to just take a hold. There's nothing there, but I take a hold of it, and I just hold on to Jesus until the, until the storm is passed. All of us have to learn to live dependent upon him. And if you don't get it this year, you know, you got the rest of your life. Then you got the millennial reign. Then you got the golden age. As the ages roll out one after another, as long as it takes, a good God, he's willing to teach you. This is how you depend upon me. These things saith he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum, but, but therefore, many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Now, when it says his disciples, it doesn't mean the 12. They, they may have been struggling too, but he had a larger set of disciples. It would sometimes be very many and sometimes less. But there were more disciples that he had than just the 12. But many there, therefore of his disciples, when they heard him saying, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood that you might have eternal life, they said, man, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Who can hear it? Now, when we look at this term, it's a hard saying. Again, reading after Kenneth Wiest, he translates that statement to say, this is an offensive and intolerable discourse. <laughs> it was offensive not because they didn't understand it. They understood exactly what Jesus was saying. Because again, he was introduced as the Lamb of God. He said, I give my flesh for the life of the world. That means you're a sacrifice. You're introduced as the Lamb. Uh, they had a thing when, when in Israel when the, they brought the Lamb to the brazen altar it was called the compassion and it simply meant that that little lamb gave all of itself i mean when they butchered that lamb first they cut his throat at the brazen altar and they poured the blood out at the side of the altar then they cut the entrails out and put the entrails upon the fire then they cut the animal apart and put it upon the fire and that animal was completely consumed it was called the compassion well, that's what Jesus did. He came and he was completely consumed upon a Calvary's cross. He gave everything that he had. And they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? You see, they wanted, they wanted another David. Israel was looking for another King David that would expand the, the Davidic kingdom back to the way it was under Solomon. They were looking for a military leader. They were not looking for a crucified Jew. They, they weren't looking for a lamb. They were looking for a lion. Now, don't get it wrong. He is a lion, but he came in the incarnation as a lamb. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest. Was, it means that he was incarnate to destroy the works of the devil. This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Now, it, the first phrase, when Jesus knew in himself... when he knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it. Again, Jesus was always God. There was no time in his incarnation that he was not God. But he laid aside the expression of his deity, but he maintained the possession of his deity. And so simply means that although he was God, he would not use any of his God powers. So then how could he know in himself that people were murmuring in their heart against his statements? It's because the Holy Spirit gave the church, really the, the, Jesus did, nine spiritual gifts. There's nine gifts given, ministry gifts given to the church. One of them is the word of knowledge. The word of knowledge is supernatural knowing of things present or past that you had no way to naturally know that. It, it's the Holy Spirit giving it to you supernaturally and just setting it in you. It's very much like the word of wisdom. The word of knowledge is 
present and past things that you have supernatural knowledge of. The word of wisdom is future things that you have supernatural knowledge of. And we'll see that in just a moment. I'm saying all of that to say this. All of the miracles, all of the healings that Jesus did, he did none of them because he was God. He did all of them because of his dependence upon the Father that allowed the Holy Spirit to move through him in these nine spiritual gifts. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, if I'm, if I'm teaching that night, I'll try to go through. I believe seven of the nine spiritual gifts fired one after another to raise Lazarus from the dead. You know, we see it as just one miracle. That Jesus just walked out and said, Lazarus, come forth. Well, well that's a miracle. That is a miracle. But whatever killed Lazarus is still in his body. If he had a tumor or cancer, whatever, it's still there. So there also has to be a healing that takes place in order for him to continue uh, to live. And so if I'm teaching that night, I'll, I'll try to bring those up. But I want you to understand that Jesus did nothing because he was God, although he was God. Everything that he did, he did through the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, the same spiritual gifts that Jesus operated in are available to the church. And they still operate in the church. They did not die with the last apostle. Don't, don't drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> They're still very much active for those that will believe. Jesus, when he knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? Now again, we see Jesus, he's not backing up. He's not afraid of anything. He's saying, what, are you guys offended by this too? <laughs> What if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? In other words, he's saying, you're getting offended because I told you I, I came down from heaven. What are you going to do when you see me go back? <laughs> if my coming down from heaven offends you, what are you going to do when you see me raised from the dead and, and then ascend back to the Father? Now, all of this makes sense to us. Because we're 2,000 years removed, but it's also a lesson to us that when we don't understand something spiritual, don't, don't take an attitude, don't take a position. Just listen and learn and ask God. God will give you the knowledge that you need, but patiently approach him in prayer. Say, God, I, I, don't, I don't get this. And he'll either show you in his word, he'll have a preacher speak it. Just stay attentive, and he will give you the knowledge that you're seeking for. Jesus says, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. He's simply saying that everything, uh, and of course, these people followed Jesus across the lake because they was looking for another meal originally. He had fed the, the 5,000 with the loaves and fishes. He came across the lake at night, woke walked three to four miles and met the disciples in the middle of the lake in the storm and then came over. Well, the next morning, the people came after him because they were looking for breakfast. They, they were looking for more. And then Jesus said, well, wait a minute now. Now it's time for you to eat my flesh and drink my blood. No more, no, no more loaves and fish. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they became offended at it. And Jesus says, it's the spirit that's quickened. Quicken means to make alive. It's the, the spirit that's made alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. In other words, the words that we get from Jesus Christ, they're not primarily to, to bless our flesh. You know, we've tried in, a, in this progressive church that's out and about now, we try to take all of Jesus' words and mean that it's just another natural blessing for me. You know, a, a bigger car or a bigger house or a bigger bankroll. Or, or hitting the lottery or, or some other nonsense. But Jesus deals, he feeds the inner man. The outward man perishes. But the inward man is renewed day by day. And, and what the word gives us, what, what study gives us, what time in church gives us, it builds up the inner man. You can't see him, but if he ever dies, you'll know the difference. If you stop feeding him and let him get weak, you're going to be able to tell the difference all of a sudden. See, many of us are strong in the Lord because the inner man is strong. The outward man's kind of, kind of feeble, to be honest with you. Have you ever noticed that the older you get, the weaker you get? 
<laughs> and all you start feeling all of your frailties. But the inward man, we're going to be surprised when this body falls off. We're going to be surprised what we really are. And, and let me just point out something. You are not a body. You are not a body. You are a living soul. When God breathed into Adam's nostrils, he stood up a living soul. That's what you are. God has given you a spirit. The body is the, the case that it's all wrapped up in. But when this body goes away, your soul and spirit, man, it, you'll still be just like you are now. You will look the same. <laughs> you will have the same personality, although God's going to raise it to a level of perfection. You still have your own individual choices because it doesn't come from your physical body. It comes from your soul and your spirit. Jesus says, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Just, just meaning they are not natural and they're not meant to primarily benefit the natural man. Although the natural man will be benefited just because he's with the soul and the spirit. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Jesus says there are some of you that believe not. Now this lets you know that Jesus was able, for his disciples that was there, he was able to see their faith or lack of faith. He was able to know you don't believe, even though you're here, you don't believe on what I'm, what I'm teaching and what I'm preaching. It goes on to say, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Now here, this is different than before. Before it was a word of knowledge. This is a word of wisdom. He knew from the beginning of his ministry, before it ever showed up, before Judas betrayed him, Jesus knew at the beginning. Before the disciples, unbelief was in the heart. Jesus knew from the beginning. That's the word of, of wisdom, a supernatural knowledge of things that have not yet transpired. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Now you think about that. Uh, this, here's the mind of God. Jesus knew from the beginning, when he picked Judas Iscariot, he knew from the beginning, this is the one that will betray me. He betrayed him because Judas loved money. He, he, was, he had avarice. He had greed. He, the Bible says that he was a thief and he held the bag over and over. That means that he he held the bag. He was the treasurer of Jesus' ministry. And he ended up selling Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He loved money. Jesus knew from the beginning. And what did he do? I, I don't understand how God works. He makes him the treasurer. <laughs> you know, something I do know about God, he will catch you in your own snare. <laughs> he, will, he will just keep giving you rope. And all of us, the, our life here, all of us, we're proving who we are. We're proving what we are. We're, we're showing God, this is what I am. It, not in one day or one act, but over the course of our lives, we show God, this is what I am. I've proved this is what I am. Jesus knew from the beginning who it was that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. From that time, many of his, of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So when he realized there were those that believed not, he realized Judas was going to betray him. He, he knew these things from the beginning. And so he said, that's why I told you no man can come to me except the father draw him. You see, many of these people were following after Jesus because they thought he was the new King David. And they wanted a political position in his organization. That, that's what Judas wanted. That, that's what the, the sons of thunder wanted. It, they, to have their mother come and ask Jesus, let one of my sons sit on your left and the other sit on your right. They wanted political positions. But Jesus didn't come to be a politician, thank God. 
<laughs> Thank God we don't need another one. <clears throat> no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. He's telling them, you try to, through your own will, approach me. But it takes the Holy Spirit to draw you. See, nobody can just say, well, you know what? Today, I, no sinner says, today I think I'll get saved. I'm just smoke this last cigarette and have a beer as I'm walking down to the church, and I'm going to go down right now and get saved. That doesn't happen. The Holy Spirit begins to pull the heart little by little, just little by little. And sometimes the sinner doesn't even know what's happening. I knew in my life when I was in sin, I just got tired. I, I was running so hard, I just got tired of sin, and I knew I can't last like this. <laughs> I need to make a change, but I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what I was doing. So I was trying to turn the best I could into a better position. It wasn't necessarily looking for Jesus, though. I'm just trying not to die on drugs. <laughs> and as I'm, as I'm turning, one day my mouth accidentally said, Jesus, and whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, Right there, the power of God fell upon me. But, but there, the reason I was tired of sin, there's the Holy Spirit, it pulls, he tugs. Sometimes the sinning person doesn't even know that it's the Holy Spirit, but yet there's still that movement towards the things of God. And when that doesn't happen, you can witness that person until your tongue falls out. And they will not, they will not give you an ear. So he's telling them that many of you came after me basically for political positions, but no man can come unto me except it were given unto him by my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. In other words, many of these were looking for those positions. They were looking for positions of honor. I want to be set up as one of your men in your new administration, your new kingdom. And when he said, no, you got to be drawn into this. And he just got through saying, eat my flesh and drink my blood. They just said, man, I, who is this man? I'm, I'm getting out of here. They just walked away from me. You know, that's got to break. That had to break Jesus' heart. You just think about that. He's here. He's getting ready to go to the cross and die for the life of the world. He, he did everything to say, whosoever will, come unto me. And yet men walked away. And, and the, the tragedy is that the vast majority of the human race will reject Jesus Christ and spend eternity in hell. And Jesus did everything within his power. He did way more than you and I would have done I might have sent you a letter. <laughs> but I don't believe I would have went to no cross. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will you go also? <laughs> See, this shows you that Jesus is not afraid. He wasn't afraid. Uh-oh, uh, uh, we just had a group of them leave. Oh, my goodness. You guys going to leave too? Come on, you guys stay here. That's, that's not who Jesus is. He looked at the 12 and said, well, you guys going to go too? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Peter, Peter got this absolutely 100% right. If you leave Jesus, where are you going? Where is there to go? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, that's a strong statement. Peter could not put, have put together a better group of words than that statement right there. And in essence, here's what he's saying. He's saying, Jesus, you're, you're the only one that has uh, the words of life. You are the only Messiah that will ever be offered to the world. And you are the only begotten Son of God. There is nowhere else to go. You know, when, when people backslide, I, 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 I sometimes I wonder, having backslid twice myself, but I still wonder, where, where are you going, man? Even, even if it's your salvation, you're having difficulty in your salvation, keep swimming. 
You don't give up and turn around because you have to realize, what is my destination? Where, where am I going? And Peter made a, a wonderful statement. Where is there to go? Jesus is the only one that has the words of eternal life. Jesus answered, him, answered them, have I not chosen you 12? And one of you is a devil. He spake of Jesus Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. You know, that's, man, that, when you have the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, referring to you as a devil, that, that's a horrible place. Peter knows what that is, because one time Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, and was talking directly to Peter. But here he's talking with regard to Judas Iscariot, and we look at the word devil, <coughs> we look at the word devil, and it's diabolos in the Greek, and it, it basically means the devil, a, a slanderer, use, uh, an accuser of the brethren. But Jesus is using it here in a, a wider definition. He's really referring to him as an enemy, a one that is hostile to him. Uh, so it's an expanded definition of the word devil, the way that he's using it. But he puts his, he, he knows exactly who he's talking about. One of you 12, one of you is a devil. It, here's the, the mind of God, the mysterious mind of God. Jesus prayed all night long when he picked the 12 disciples. The night before he picked the 12 disciples, he prayed the whole night long. And then he began to pick disciples. And he purposely, on purpose, picked Judas, who he knew from the beginning was going to betray him. But remember, the scripture cannot be broken. And there's scripture concerning Judas. My old familiar friend that broke bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. The scripture that Jesus had to be betrayed, 30 pieces of silver. And so from the very beginning, after all night prayer, part of that prayer was to make sure that I picked the right person, <laughs> not just the 11 that were going to walk with me, but the right person that was going to betray me. That's the foreknowledge and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. He spake of Jesus, uh, Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the 12. Okay, very good. That's good timing. So we'll pick up with chapter 7 uh, next week. When we come, I hope that you're getting something out of this. Sometimes it's just good to hear another perspective. But it's not just that we want to give you nuggets of information about what different phrases of the word means. We want to show you the approach that you take to the word of God. That it's not a book that we just read, but it's a, it's, it's a pool of water that you dive into uh, and, and get everything out of it that you can. And so hopefully we give you both information and also uh, give you an attitude of study and how to approach the Word of God. So with that being said, my brother, would you come receive our offering? Amen. All right. That was a good teaching tonight. All right. If you don't mind, would you uh, clear your heads and clear, uh, prepare to give? And as we uh, have multiple ways to give for everybody in the house tonight, you know we got the baskets on the back for our guests online. We have text to give. With all that being said, if you don't mind, please bow your heads for a word of prayer so we can be dismissed. Father, we thank you for the teaching on tonight. We thank you for how your uh, blessing is so richly, God. We pray that you would just bless the offering, bless those that had to give and those that didn't have to give, God. We pray that we would use our resources to further your kingdom even the more. Father, we pray that as we depart from this place, not departing from you, that you would just protect us, God, and keep your angels of mercy around us, God. We, we thank you and we bless you, Lord, for all that you're doing in our lives, God. We, in Jesus' name, amen.